So you want to go small. What's some practical ideas, some things that need to be considered and thought about as you try to think through the question of how you go small with filling your capacity needs? Specifically, four different approaches for going small. Um, and then I'm going to talk about four different obstacles that no matter what path you decide to take, these four obstacles are always in the considerations of things that have to be dealt with. And then last but not least, I want to talk about some very specific things that have to do with LTE that you should consider as you decide which method and how to implement your small cell strategy. I won't dwell on this. I think everybody in this room by now knows that the issue is really all about capacity. How do we bring more capacity to the subscribers? How do the MSOs build up their networks to fulfill the demand? <clears throat> but fundamentally, no matter how you slice the pie, there's only three ways to really add capacity. One way is to use the spectrum that you have more efficiently. And that basically is the essence of transitioning from a GSM modulation to a CDMA modulation to an OFDM modulation. It's the radio interface, right? So that's one key way. The second way is to add more spectrum, just as you mentioned. We would like to have more spectrum. The third way, and traditionally the way that's brought the most capacity to any network at any time, is adding more cells. So if you were at the keynote speak this morning, uh, we talked about densification. So this third area is really this whole concept of densification. How do you take the cell structure, split it, <coughs> reduce it, duplicate it, add more cells? The more cells you can add, the more dense you can make the network, and ultimately that's the number one largest contributor to how to build capacity. So if you are out of capacity and everything that you've known how to do in the past is to build a macro site, your natural inclination, if you could, would be to build another macro. It's what we know how to do. We've been doing it for 25 years. Everybody's an expert at it. It's a cookie cutter approach. If we could do it, we would add another macro. But the reality is, where do you put it? There's not that many places to put new macros, especially where you need the capacity. Um, what bands would you put that at? And how long would it last? Because chances are it will run out of capacity pretty soon. So that's where the topic of small cells comes into play, right? So that's how the whole discussion of how we get to small cells happens. And there's a lot of different ways and a lot of different people that define small cells in different ways. My point of view is that a small cell should really be thought about as anything that's not a macro. Right? So you know what a macro is. So a small cell is really anything that's not a macro. I mean, it could be a DAS application. Our point of view is that DAS is the original small cell. It was small cell before small cell was cool. Uh, and now we have evolutions of how that kind of small cell application can be done with PICO radios, FEMTO radios, all the different applications. But fundamentally, what I'd like to challenge the industry to do is to think about the problem, not the box that we're trying to position as a solution. How do we solve the whole problem of bringing capacity into those hard to cover areas? So really, this is the ecosystem that we're talking about. We're not talking about some neighborhood out in far west Texas where there's a lot of space and a lot of things to happen. This is the ecosystem that we're trying to address with a go small strategy. You've got big venues like we talked about earlier. You have the big venues, you have big airports, you have high rise buildings, you have the medium to large enterprise type applications, city parks, camp, uh, university campuses, all those kind of dense urban things that have one characteristic that's really quite unique. That characteristic is that the user profile is dynamic. The number of users and the kind of, kind of dimension of capacity constraints or co capacity consumption they're going to put on an MSO's network is very dynamic. At any given time, that stadium might have an event that has 20,000 people at it. The next week, it could have an event that has 100,000 people at it. So the challenge for the MSOs is how do you 
scale a capacity plan that can scale and that's quite a difficult challenge. So if you take this whole ecosystem into consideration and then we start to break that down, we can look at different ways to maybe address those challenges. Certainly for stadiums, large airports, big high rise buildings, shopping malls like the Galleria here that we're at today, DAS is a great way to go. We just talked about that earlier. That's a great way to go. It's typically a multi-tenant, multi-operator, multi-frequency, multi-technology type application where you're trying to launch all those multi-X type capabilities at the subscriber base. And they typically have very high capacity in terms of the number of users. And there's a lot of dynamicness about the consumption rate of capacity in those type of venues. So DAS has been, and we think will continue to be, the right application for those kind of solutions, for those kind of applications. Then when we look at the enterprise type of applications, hospitals, medium to large enterprise buildings, the application of Pico radio type technologies or many remote radio head type technologies probably seems to be a pretty good fit for those kind of applications today. So it's another tool that can be used in the toolkit. Now, coming from the perspective of Andrew, and hopefully those of you who know Andrew know that we're mostly an RF company. Uh, we do everything but the radio in the RF network. Um, we also think a good way to approach small cell capacity is to take an outside in look at it. So one, one objective would be find the hot sector on your macro site. You have an existing macro site. Right? So you have an existing asset. Find the hot sector. Let's say this sector, the alpha sector here. Let's say it's overloaded at capacity. One approach to help solve the capacity problem is split that sector. So if this face, if this sector faces an enterprise application or a campus dormitory, for example. That's a good idea, it's a good approach. You can look at that particular sector, look at taking that from a standard uh, 65 degree antenna sector to two 33 degree antennas. Double the capacity, increase the signal strength. When you reduce the horizontal beam width of the antenna, you also increase the gain by 3 dB. So what happens to building penetration? It gets better. So that's what we think of as an outside in approach to solving the small cell problem, which again is how do you get capacity where you need it. Another way is what I'm calling mini macros. So a mini macro in my view is a, basically a standard radio configuration, but packaged in a way that instead of the antenna height above ground being at 50 feet or 75 feet or 100 feet, maybe these antenna heights are at 20 feet. And maybe they're packaged on a rooftop. They give the same kind of RF characteristics, the same kind of things that we already know to how to do on a macro site, except the RF and the radios have been packaged so that they're easier to install, they're easier to get zoning approval, they have a lower profile so they're easier to get neighborhoods to accept, they're easier to maintain, and ultimately they're easier to stack various types of technology into the same package. That's what I'm referring to as a mini macro. So, no matter what kind of, which one of those four, and there's others, there's Wi-Fi, I didn't talk about that at all, but there's other types of applications. No matter which of those applications you might uh, pick for a specific venue or a specific ecosystem, there's four fundamental problems that still have to be solved. One is the site acquisition. How do you get permission to put anything on any side? You gave a great example of, of how, trying to hide the antenna in a stadium. The same thing happens outside, happens inside, it has to be dealt with. Then we have to figure out how we get power. I mean, every radio needs power, so you gotta get power there. And you may think that's a simple problem, but it's not. In a lot of places, if it's like a historical venue, it's not easy getting permission to run power. The same thing with backhaul. Are we gonna use fiber? Most of the time we think about fiber as probably the, the right solutions for these ecosystems, but it's not always the right solution. Sometimes it needs to be a, a microwave solution. 
And last but not least is performance. And performance is important because there's one characteristic about LTE that I think it's imperative for all of us to keep in mind and think through. I know my friends at AT&T think about it all the time, and that is noise. LTE is an interference limited system. And beyond investing in fantastic radios, which we certainly have fantastic radios today, noise is the key limiter to achieving the ultimate goals of LTE data throughput. So no matter what we do, we have to look at noise and how we can mitigate and, and reduce noise. And again, as an antenna guy, kind of an antenna guy, one key element to reducing noise in an LTE network is to reduce the overlap of one antenna's energy on top of another antenna's energy. Seems very simple, but in fact it's really complex and very, very important to think about as you design whatever small application you might need to design. In a GSM technology, those overlaps were not nearly as important because you weren't trying to achieve you know, the kind of data throughput that we're trying to achieve now. CDMA, it's more important. Wideband or UMTS, more important because of soft or soft handoffs. With LTE, at the data rates we're trying to achieve, it's, in, it's ultimately important. So if we look at antennas from two applications, well, there's all kinds of things to consider in the antenna. Um, omni versus sector, what kind of height of the antenna versus pattern shaping is really important. We think about a small antenna. A small antenna gives really big <coughs> vertical coverage areas. So there's the potential for a lot of overlap. To get rid of all those large overlapping areas, you have to go to a taller antenna. So now you face the problem of trading off performance and size. So it's quite a trade-off that has to be thought through. And then you have size versus frequency band. If you're going to use 700 megahertz in a small cell ecosystem, a 700 megahertz antenna with two elements is twice as big as a 2.1 gigahertz antenna with two elements. So there's a size versus frequency trade-off to be made. And then last but not least here is tilt versus no tilt. Tilt is the parameter that, that RF engineers use to reduce the energy overlap from one sector to another sector or from one cell site to another cell site. The more antenna height you have, the better you can manage the tilt range. So it's an important trade-off to consider. In an outdoor consideration, uh, you can see here the difference between a simple patch antenna with one dipole that you would typically see attached to, for example, just attached to a telephone pole, a very simple little one dipole antenna, as opposed to like a four dipole antenna that's got a little capability to do some down tilting. And if we look at area spectral efficiency as the criteria, you can see that if you go from a simple antenna that has no tilting capability at all to a slightly more sophisticated antenna that we call a quasi-omni, you get a significant improvement in efficiency. So the trade-off has to be, if I can get the space, if I can get the physical space approved, I want to move to a more sophisticated antenna. If I can't get that, then I have to make the trade-offs in my network planning cycle up at the very beginning of the, of the process. Same type of thing happens with indoor sites. So just flip through these real quick. This is an indoor stadium. Using different types of antennas will give you different levels of overlap. So again, a very <coughs> important consideration to think about outside or inside. Same basic theory. Try to keep the overlap minimized. Okay, so just some closing thoughts. Uh, when we think about small cells, I really would like to encourage everyone to think about the end, not the means. You know, don't think about the, the small cell as a particular device. Think about small cell as the challenge that our MSO brothers have to take to solve the capacity problem. It's not the device, it's the problem. So think about the ends not the means. And then really explore the full toolkit. 
Uh, look at outside in, look at mini macros, look at the whole gamut of different approaches. I think it's essential that we do that. Think sidearm. The system noise ratio will drive nearly everyone. Most of the advanced LTE advanced features just simply do not work at all unless you achieve a certain level of noise score. So there's a certain level of gate that you have to achieve for any of those advanced features to even turn on. So very important. And then last, think ahead. You know, what, what next frequency band is going to be there? What's the next space? Uh, I've never seen anybody anywhere in the world plan enough capacity in their first build out anywhere, anywhere in the world. Uh, so you got to think ahead how you add new capacity. Uh, as a parting gift to all of you who attended the presentation, we've opened up uh, our website. And on our website, if you're interested, we have a free ebook called About RF. Um, if you're not an RF guy or a person and you'd like to know more about the fundamentals of RF, 200 pages. If you have a little insomnia, I guarantee it'll put you, put you to sleep if you're not an RF person. If you are, if you are an RF person, you'll love it. So please go on our website, download it, no cost, and contact me anytime.